So science, philosophy, and the meaning of life, you actually hear three different takes uh, today about this and related topics. I'm, I'm going to start here uh, giving you an overview and one example um, taken from my uh, most recent book that I'll introduce in a minute. And then Michael Shermer is going to give you a very different take on similar topics. And then the two of us are going to have what we're calling pointedly a discussion, not a debate about this thing, meaning that we're not going to fight. Um, okay, so the inspiration for this book, Answers for Aristotle, how science and philosophy can lead us uh, to a more meaningful life, actually did come from the Monty Python's uh, series of songs. Um, there is, of course, a series that's particularly appropriate. It's, it's from the, the movie Meaning of Life. But actually, if you look at Monty Python's full collection of, on, and productions, there's quite a bit there of philosophy, and there's quite a bit of investigations in the meaning of life. Um, of course, beginning with that quote from one of their songs, you know, why are we here? What's life all about? Is God really real or is there some doubt? I think there is. Um, what's the point of all, of, of all these oaks? Is it the chicken and egg problem time? Are we just yolks? Now, what I did with that was to uh, put together a series of case studies, basically, throughout the book. I picked some topics. I'll, I'll give you an idea of the topics in a minute. And then I asked for each one of them, um, what is it that both science and philosophy can tell us about it? What, how, how would a rational, intelligently informed person go about it? But first of all, we need to be clear on what is it that we're talking about to begin with. Uh, meaning, when we talk about meaning of life, for instance, you know, um, meaning, of course, is implied or explicit significance of something. It's in, uh, uh, it has to do with the importance or the worthwhile quality or the purpose of something. Now, the meaning, the kind of meaning or the meaning of meaning that I address in the book um, has to do with an ancient Greek word, um, which is often in English pronounced eudaimonia. It literally means having a good demon talking to you on your, on your, on your shoulders metaphorically talking to you. If you really do hear a demon talking to you, uh, I suggest psychiatry as a first um, approach. But the idea is that um, the eudaimonic life means to pursue happiness, well-being, or better yet, flourishing. We all flourish in different ways, and yet there is something, um, according at least to Aristotle, and um, a whole tradition in philosophy called virtue ethics, there is something that we all have in common as human beings, that there is such a thing as human nature, and so pretty much the same kinds of things, the same patterns hold uh, that make our lives worth living or not worth, worth living. Now, that's a general picture. In particular, throughout the book, I address some of these questions, you know, how do we tell right from wrong, uh, issues of personal identity, of course, God has to be there, uh, somewhere, what is justice, how do I know things, and what does it mean to love. Um, since I only have about 20 minutes left already, I'm going to actually address only one of these questions very briefly, and it is actually a question that will come back uh, throughout the rest of the morning with um, um, Michael's talk and then our, our uh, conversation. Now, historically, there have been several sources of answers to these kinds of fundamental questions that we're all interested in. Uh, and some of these sources, of course, are listed here, science, philosophy, mysticism, religion. I think I don't have to spend too much time with this audience convincing you that those two are out. They're not particularly useful. In fact, sometimes they're even pernicious. Um, what is left is something that is sometimes called scientia. The word science in English is problematic because it actually has a very specific meaning. You know, science is usually the natural sciences, somewhat the social sciences, depending on who you ask. But anyway, it's the kind of things that biologists, chemists, physicists, psychologists do. The word scientia, on the other hand, which, come, which is, of, of course, from the same root, uh, it means knowledge, and it's broader. And a lot of other languages outside of English actually use um, science in that, in, that, in that sense. That sense of science includes also logic, it includes mathematics, and includes philosophy. So the idea of the book is that the best approach to these kinds of questions, to existential questions, to questions of meaning, comes not from religion, not, not from mystical experiences or insights, whatever those may be, but from scientia, broadly construed, so from the whole storage of, of human knowledge. Okay, now let me give you an example. You probably be familiar with these kinds of questions. Uh, this is, this is a, these are the trolley dilemmas. Um, trolley dilemmas are so popular, th these are thought experiments that have uh, been concocted 
uh, some time ago by a number of philosophers, and now more recently a number of neuroscientists and cognitive scientists also got um, into using uh, trolley dilemmas for, for their purposes. In fact, it's one of the nice examples of collaborations between philosophers and, and um, natural scientists. So you're probably familiar with the basic idea, but I'm, I'm, gonna, write, let you, uh, I'm gonna run through the basic anyway. Uh, there, is many, there are many variations of the trolley dilemmas. Uh, these are ethical, these are hypothetical situations, thought experiments, that deal with our uh, ethical, moral intuitions. Uh, there are so many of them, in fact, that uh, the entire field is jokingly referred to as trolleyology, the study of trolley dilemmas. I'll give you just the basic two versions of it. So imagine that, uh, that you are uh, the guy with the question mark over there, and you see the trolley, um, outside of New York and a few other um, American cities, I actually have to explain what a trolley is. Um, but I hope that you guys understand what we're talking about here. So the trolley is coming down the track, and you realize that uh, the, the trolley is going to hit the five workers on the um, on your left on the left track. Uh, there's no way you can stop it. Uh, you know, there's, even if you uh, yell, the, the, the workers are not going to hear it. Uh, the conductor is incapable of doing anything about it. So anything you think about of, uh, as a way of out of the dilemma, it has been blocked because philosophers are very careful and very nasty when they uh, come up with these designs. There's nothing you can do other than pull the lever, see that lever that is next to you, conveniently located, and divert the trolley to the second track, in which case you will kill only one worker. Okay, question. How many of you, raise your hands, um, would in fact pull the lever? Okay, so the majority of people, not everybody, the majority of people will uh, pull the lever. This is pretty typical. This experiment has been done cross-culturally using instead of trolleys other things, but essentially we get pretty much the same results. 80 to 85% of people actually tend to answer, yes, I would. Now, here are things when, where things become interesting. So we got a second version of the dilemma. Same situation. The trolley is coming down. It's about to kill the five workers. But this time, you don't have a lever. You're still the guy with the question mark, because as a good philosopher, you had doubts about what to do. What is it is that you have a really strong, big guy next to you on the bridge, and you can push the guy over and block the trolley. Now, again, it's a thought experiment. So yes, the, the guy will in fact precisely fall on the tracks exactly in time, and it does have exactly the mass to st stop the trolley. So don't, don't bother yourself with phys you know, physics. This is philosophy. <laughs> now, in the original version of this dilemma, the, the, the guy was referred to as a fat guy. That's not politically correct. <laughs> so it is referred now as a particular beefy guy, a, a Schwarzenegger sort of guy. So imagine that, okay? Now, question. Well, exactly. Forget the Schwarzenegger because otherwise we're getting into politics here. But imagine, imagine now that that is your only option. Now, how many people would in fact push the guy, directly push the guy off the bridge to stop the trolley? Some people would, but a much smaller number of people actually would. This also is very typical. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on is that uh, as I said, philosophers got together with, with neuroscientists and they figured out that there is an interesting uh, distinction here between the, the philosophical reflection that goes into decision making of this sort and what the brain actually does when you are presented the first time uh, with the dilemma. So from one, from one philosophical perspective, let's say a utilitarian perspective, um, which is the situation where you look at simply the, the total amount of happiness that you produce and the total amount of pain that you produce with your actions. Uh, from that perspective, there is no difference between the two situations. In both cases, you're still uh, saving five lives, uh, losing one. On average, you gain four lives, so it should be a no-brainer for a utilitarian that uh, you should, in fact, both pull the lever and push the guy. What happens instead is that you know, we can map your brain and see what happens inside it in terms of moral decision making. And these are, these are just some general ideas about how your brain works when it's, it's, it's engaging in, in, uh, in moral thinking. And it turns out that uh, people, when, when people contemplate the first part of the moral dilemma, uh, of, the, of the trolley dilemma, that is the one with the lever, with the lever, mostly what's going on it is in the orbital frontal and ventromedial parts of your brain. That is, th those areas that are involved actually with, you know, sort of logical reasoning, you know, you're, you're thinking about this thing carefully and you're making a decision. 
When you switch to the second type of, um, of dilemma, the second version of the dilemma, that when you push the guy, actually what's happening is mostly your, most of your um, uh, brain activity is found in the amygdala. The amygdala is one of those areas that are involved in emotional responses. So what's going on there is the reason mo mo many of you answered yes to the lever and no we're pushing the guys because in the first case you're sort of looking at things so from a certain distance and rationally thinking about it. In the, second, in the second case you're actually picturing yourself literally physically pushing the guy. That causes an emotional reaction. You really don't want to get into that sort of situation so you're much more um, careful about, about answering. As it turns out, you might have noticed that, and, and here the, the darkness actually helps. Um, some people have answered yes to both. Those people, turn out, likely have a borderline sociopathic um, <laughs> profile. That is, they don't engage their emotional responses when they make moral decisions. Um, now, do what you want with that kind of information. Um, there are a couple of psychiatrists around the corner that I can uh, recommend. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because it does help, I think, in terms of thinking broadly about, about issues, moral issues, both personally and in society. It does help to look both at the science of it and, and at the, um, the sort of the philosophy, the ethical reasoning of it. Uh, these kinds of dilemmas, of course, are, as I said, entirely hypothetical. There usually are no trolley. Although, there is, if you actually um, go on YouTube and search for trolley dilemma, you will find an incredibly eerily realistic movie that puts you in the, that, those situations, in, uh, um, including screaming uh, workers that um, are being hit by the train, you know, that sort of stuff. So if you want to have a better experience of, instead of just the slides, uh, do that this afternoon and you'll see what I mean. Now, it does have, these kinds of things do actually have applications in real life. I mean, you, you, you're probably aware that over the last several months, we've been having as a society somewhat of a discussion on the use, for instance, of drones and other remote controlled ways of, of killing our opponents, enemies, imagined or real. Now, uh, these kinds of situations apply to those, to, to, to those problems because one of the, the issues that have, has come up um, over and over in discussions of drones and similar technologies is that they really do take the emotional response, much of the emotional response out of the way in, in the soldier. I mean, you know, it used to be that you go in battle, you have, you know, the adrenaline goes up and it, clearly your emotions are in fact involved into these things, very much so when you make decisions uh, because your life is at, it's at risk and you see directly the effects of what you're doing. But now we're getting in a situation where, you know, if you operate one of these machiner machineries, you uh, have a nice breakfast with your family in the morning, you go to work at nine o'clock, you kill a few people, it looks like a uh, video game, so you don't actually hear anybody screaming, you don't, you don't see the carnage or anything, and then at five o'clock you to punch the, the clock and go home and have a nice dinner um, with the family. That does have consequences, and those are the kinds of things that, that both neuroscientists and ethicists are, are concerned with. Now, as I said in the beginning, what I'm interested in is the interface, the, the interplay between science and philosophy in addressing these kinds of, of issues. So in the case of morality, for instance, we know, we're beginning to know a little bit, uh, not as much as we'd like, but a little bit about where a sense of morality comes from and how it works. I showed you a little bit about the brain, so you know, we, we're beginning to know quite a bit about how the brain actually works when we make this, uh, moral decision making. Incidentally, whenever you see you know, one of these fMRI scans and all that and they tell you, oh look, um, really it's all in the brain. What is happening is just that your brain is doing this or that or the other. Well, what else would you think happen? Everything you think and do and, be, and, and every, every aspect of your behavior begins with the brain. So it, this thing that, oh, gee, it's the brain. What did you think you were doing? Your stomach? Your food? Um, where would that come from? Anyway, so back to the, to the, uh, the story. So we, we need to know something about where a sense of morality, a sense of right and wrong, we have a very strong instinct as a species of right and wrong even though we apply that instinct to different situations, and those situations are very much culturally sensitive, but we have a very strong instinctive reaction that certain things really do feel right and certain things uh, feel wrong. It's sort of um, analogous to the, the uh, language instinct that we have. We have, an, we have a natural capacity to speak, to learn languages. 
Of course, we do not have a natural capacity to speak English or Chinese or German or Italian. That one is entirely uh, culturally dependent. But the ability to actually learn a language, grammar, and so on and so forth, uh, seems to be at least in most part innate. It's the same idea here. Uh, primatologists like Franz de Waal, for instance, have discovered quite a bit about these sort of things. Um, evolutionary biologists in general can tell you pretty interesting stories. Um, about the basic building blocks of, of what we call morality. They are present in a lar large number of, of animal species. Uh, we begin with kin selection. This is the idea that uh, many animals, many mammals especially, have a, have a strong instinct to protect their, their own offspring. And the idea is that, of course, that is because your offspring carries at least part of your genes, so you want your genes to, not consciously necessarily, but you want your genes to go to the next generation. This is an example, it's a female squirrel that gives out alarm calls when they're, uh, to save their progeny from a predator. Interestingly, the male doesn't do that, son of a bitch. Um, <laughs> it's just a female. Um, another component that, that is very much important in human relations also is uh, referred to as reciprocal altruism. Reciprocal altruism is found in a few animal species, one of which is the vampire bats. The vampire bats do exactly what their name sounds like. They, they live on blood, although not human blood, usually cattle. Now, the thing with the vampire bats is that their metabolism is so high, so fast, that they actually have to feed every night. Um, they live in very large swarms, very large groups, and they uh, go out at night to feed, but um, as it turns out, often not everyone gets fed every night, which means that there is a high risk of starvation if you are a vampire bat every night. What, uh, what happened is that the system of recipro reciprocal altruism evolved such that if you are nesting next to another bat who is not necessarily your kin, and so it's not a case of kin selection, um, and you happen to, you know, have been lucky that night, you, you got fed, the other one didn't, uh, what you do is you regurgitate some of your food, some of your blood, and share it. The expectation, of course, is that if tomorrow you are going to be the unlucky one, then uh, your, your, your friend, your buddy, is going to do the same. And that's what's called the reciprocal altruism. Of course, it's not really altruism, because it's done with the, the expectation of reciprocity, eventually. But, um, but that is one of, those are two of the building blocks of even human morality. When it comes to humans, however, we have much more complicated systems like, than those, some of which are present, at least embryonically, in other primates, not necessarily in, in uh, mammals and certainly not in other animals, but, but in, um, in uh, primates. For instance, the, the presence of uh, moral sentiments, the idea that we can um, experience empathy for other people, that we have an uh, innate sense of fairness and reciprocity. Those are, are very well developed in humans, but they are actually present in a number of other primate species. Um, social pressure. Uh, social pressure is a very important component of m any moral system. Um, there has to be a, a you know, moral system in a society that doesn't work unless there is cooperation among individuals, there is punishment, there is reward, and there is such thing as reputation. You develop a reputation uh, among your, your, your fellow um, in-groups. Now, all of these exist in other primates, but are much less systematic than in humans. Now, some of these are actually costly from a biological perspective. Uh, to punish a member of a group, as some bonobos, chimpanzees, for instance, do, it's costly. Uh, because when you take time to punish another member of the group because uh, he or she has done something that undermines, let's say, um, uh, group survival or, or, uh, or group flourishing, then what you're doing is, first of all, you're using some of your time instead of going after food and sex, which are the only two things that are important evolutionarily. Um, you're actually wasting some time into something that is not directly benefiting you. Not only that, but you put yourself at risk because typically if you want to punish somebody, um, that somebody might not like that idea and so they may fight back. And if they fight back, then there's an issue of injury and so on and so forth. So all of those things are actually costly behaviors, which means that the group has to agree. Of course, in the case of the bonobos, it, that agreement is not done through the drawing of a constitution and laws. It's done instinctively. Uh, in the case of human beings, it's actually enforced by, by explicit agreements, uh, social contract laws, and so on and so forth. Reputation is another thing that is very important in a social group. Um, a lot of us tend to think of gossiping as sort of a low-level uh, social activity that it's best not indulged with, but in fact, it's a crucial glue to human societies, because through gossip, you figure out if that person is or is not, is not trustworthy. Okay. It's, it's how we exchange information about, about individuals, including the trustworthiness of the gossiper himself. 
You know, if it turns out you start spreading rumors uh, and false rumors about other people and then it comes out, then your own reputation is in fact at risk, right? So these, these are all mechanisms that are necessary for um, an ethically functioning society and you can see how they evolved gradually because they're found uh, in, in other uh, primates. Finally, we get to what we normally refer to in, 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 uh, when we think of, when we think of moral, human morality, and that is judgment, the use of judgment and reasoning, explicit judgment and reasoning to defend our ethical positions, right? So this depends on internalizing other people's needs and goals. It, it is an uh, issue of self-reflective moral judgment. You have to use logic. Uh, you have to uh, you know, build arguments and so on and so forth. That's, uh, you know, if you go in front of the Supreme Court, you will have to, you can't say, well, it's just, I just got this empathic feeling for this. No, you have to actually come up with a reasoning, with a logic um, to defend your position. That is essentially human only. Okay? That we don't know of any other primate philosopher, um, at least so far. Why am I telling you this? Because these two things put together, uh, the neurobiology of moral decision making and the evolutionary biology of moral decision making, uh, demystify the process or the phenomenon. Uh, they tell you clearly that moral decision making has biological roots as we would expect if we're naturalists, if we don't believe that God all of a sudden came in and put the soul in and, all of a, and, and everything was fine all of a sudden. They have to have a, nat a, a natural root, a, a biological origin, and in fact we're beginning to get some idea at least of where these roots come from. So I think that as a naturalist, as a skeptic, these, 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 sort, of, these sort of things are necessary as a uh, part of the big picture of morality. Um, it's also important, of course, to realize that it's not just that your brain does it, but certain specific parts of your brain, and sometimes your brain doesn't work quite as well as, as we would like it to work. I mean, the brain, after all, yes, it did evolve in part to engage in, in um, ethical decision making, but also in all sorts of other things. And at any rate, it evolved to engage in ethical decision making that typically was limited to a very small number of individual members of your own group. But we live in a society where increasingly the membership is very, very large. We're now into the several billions, and you don't know most of the members of your society, even within your, your, your own city. You don't know most of the people you deal with. So now we're, we're talking about situations that are much more complicated. They're way beyond what natural selection and evolution have been able to deal with. And so what do you do with it? Uh, one way to think about this is that the evolution of moral decision making uh, sort of grossly underdetermines the ethical problems that we have today. That is, if you just had the information I gave you so far, you wouldn't know how to go about talking about drones or abortion or a lot of or gay rights or any of the, the kinds of things that really engage modern ethical decision making. Okay? You would simply know that um, if your uh, buddy comes in and it's starving, you probably should share some of your food. And you, should, and you would simply know that you know, if, if your kin is in trouble, you should help him. And that's about it, kind of. So what do we go, how do we go beyond that? That's where the philosophy comes in. Now philosophers, of course, have been thinking about um, moral decision making for you know, ethics in general for at least two and a half millennia. Um, so the, and philosophy go, works very slowly. Um, it does make progress, contrary to um, uh, popular opinion, even among, among skeptics. Um, but it's very slow progress. And it's made of, out of exploring uh, possibilities in logical space. Uh, unlike science, science explores possibilities in empirical space. And the empirical space is much more limited than the logical space. There are a lot of things that are logically possible, but they're empirically not true, not the case. So when you deal with logical space, you have a lot more stuff going on, and so progress is a little more slow. Now, very briefly, in the next few minutes, I'm going to give you sort of this, what I call a, a menu of possible choices. These are three of the major ways of thinking about morality that philosophers have come up with over the last uh, several millennia. I am not going to tell you that one is the right one, nor that, that e any one of these provides with the right answers. I think that the idea of a right answer as, uh, in, in uh, philosophy in general is misguided. There is a right answer to an empirical question. If I ask you whether it is the earth that goes around the sun or the sun around the earth, there's only one correct answer to that question, and the only way you can get it is through empirical inf uh, investigation. But if I ask you whether, whether and how and at what circumstances abortion is um, uh, the right thing to do, there is no unique answer. It does depend on complex ways of thinking about it. There, is more than, there may be more than one good way to think about the problem. So here are the basic three. We already encountered the first one. 
Utilitarianism, or sometimes referred to more broadly as consequentialism. This is a framework that was originated by Jeremy Bentham and then John Stuart Mill, who is the guy pictured there. And it is about consequences. It is the idea that what is morally right or what is morally wrong depends on the consequences of your actions. Not of your intentions, not of general laws uh, or rules, but on, your, on the consequences. So the utilitarian, for instance, in the case of the trolley dilemma, very likely would say that yes, it is okay to pull the lever and it is also okay to push the guy off the bridge because in terms of consequences, the consequences are identical, okay? As I said, however, there is research that shows that utilitarians tend to be a little bit on the sociopathic end of the spectrum. So take that as a, with a grain of salt. The second major way, framework of, of thinking, of ways of thinking about ethical problems um, is what is refer referred to as deontology, which is duty-based ethics. Deontological systems tend to have rules. The most famous, of course, of the deontological systems are religious ones. The Ten Commandments are a typical example of a deontological ethical system. But we said earlier on, and we, I, I think we agreed because I didn't hear anybody shouting contrary to it, that religion isn't really relevant to these kinds of discussions, so we need a um, secular version of deontology. The most uh, developed and most famous one is by Immanuel Kant, who incidentally was a very religious person, but he realized that, we needed, uh, that he needed a secular way to establish um, a system of morality. So he came up with uh, uh, some interesting ideas that um, you will find elaborated in, in the book. But basically, uh, Kant thought that uh, there is one fundamental rule, he called it a categorical imperative, and that rule is categorical, there's no exceptions, and it's an imperative, you have to do it. Uh, that rule has a couple of different versions, but one of them is that you should never treat other people as uh, means to an end, but only as ends in themselves. Uh, the other version, the other common version, is that um, um, you should uh, never do anything, uh, uh, let me rephrase it, that something is wrong if you would not agree for that action to be a universal rule. So if you ask yourself, you know, is murder a bad thing, uh, well, ask yourself if everybody agreed that, that uh, it was okay to go around murdering people, you probably wouldn't have a pleasant society to live with, so the answer is no. Now, there are pro problems with the ontology just as there are with utilitarianism, um, one of which, for, for instance, a typical example is uh, Kant thought that it was always wrong to lie. But it's fairly easy actually to come up with situations where it is not only not wrong, but in fact the right thing to do. Uh, the typical example is you're in, back in World War II, the Nazi officer knocks on your door and says, do you happen by any chance to have a Jew uh, hanging around in, the, in your basement? You say, absolutely, yes, go ahead and you know, pick him up. Um, now, you probably would say, um, absolutely no, what are you talking about? Um, you'd be lying. So you'd be, now as a rule, as a general rule, it is true that lying is not a good idea. It does undermine the social fabric, but there are very, very clear circumstances under which, in fact, it is acceptable. The last framework that I briefly want to talk to you about is, uh, I already mentioned this one as well, it's virtue ethics. This goes back to Aristotle, although there is a modern version of it, it's ref sometimes referred to as neo-Aristotelianism. Um, virtue ethics is, is an interesting idea because it's very different from the other two. The other, in the other two cases, like in most moral philosophy, the question that the moral philosopher is uh, setting up to answer is, is something right or wrong? Right? When we think about morality, typically that's the kinds of things we have in mind. Is it moral to have abortion? Is it moral to uh, allow gay uh, marriage? You know, those kinds of things. We have, we're asking whether something is wrong or, or, or not. But for most, of, most ancient Greeks, that would have been a funny question and sort of besides the point. The point of ethics, the point of, of moral, moral philosophy, was not to find out of whether something is right or wrong, but, whether, but rather to find out what kind of life you should live. And once you find that out, the answers to other questions sort of follow uh, through. So it is called virtual ethics because it's about character. It's about building character, character through the uh, cultivation of virtues. And the virtues here are not the Christian virtues. This, we're not talking about chastity and uh, you know, piety and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we're talking about things like equanimity and a sense of justice, uh, courage, those kinds of things. So in the case of virtual ethic, ethical approaches to questions, you sort of, you really rephrase the question. You would say, in the case of the uh, trolley dilemma, for instance, you would say, well, what would, be, what would a good person do in those cases? And sometimes the answer is, it depends. 
a good person would actually examine this, that complex situation and it may come out with, uh, with different answers. Different good people may come up with different, reasonably different answers because they evaluate honestly the situation in a different way. So virtual ethics doesn't give you very specific, very clear cut answers, but it does provide you with this sort of general framework of how to do things. Um, I got a couple more minutes uh, and I wanted to introduce you to um, a general method of doing things in philosophy uh, that I think is very useful also to skeptics, uh, and it's called reflective equilibrium. There's a, there's a chapter in the, in the book where I go into details on how this thing works, but let me give you an idea. So a very general way of, of doing philosophy is to engage in what is called reflective equilibrium. Reflective equilibrium is about uh, bringing more coherence to your set of beliefs, uh, and especially when those set of beliefs are challenged or informed by empirical evidence. Uh, which, of course, in the case of skeptics, is, is all the time. So imagine you go out tonight uh, in, in, uh, in Chelsea, you look up and you say, oh, I just saw a flying saucer, which for a skeptic would be kind of interesting, right? Now, imagine also that you have several other beliefs. You believe that there are no extraterrestrials visiting Earth. Uh, you believe that you do not hallucinate. Uh, and you believe that you don't make mistakes about nocturnal objects because, you know, I, I know what the moon looks like. I know what stars and planets look like, so I'm not going to make that kind of mistake. Well, that web of belief is in tension. They cannot all be true. Okay. Something has to give, maybe more than one thing, but something is not right there because if you actually try to hold to all of those beliefs simultaneously, you got a problem. you got something you cannot explain. Okay. So the process of reflective equilibrium is to go back and examine each one of these beliefs and also the evidence on which they're based and decide which one is more likely to be incorrect. In this particular example, I would say you probably dropped the, the flying saucer thing, but you never know. Uh, maybe you were in fact hallucinating um, and you know because somebody just gave you, um, you know, stuff that is hallucinogenic. So that would explain it. Not exactly unheard of around these parts. Now, you can apply the same thing, the same approach to moral decision making. Now, the case that I'm presenting you here, it's very easy. I don't, I don't think most people would have too much trouble um, uh, going through this, through this exercise, but I give this talk um, a lot of the times in the Bible Belt. And so you might Im imagine the audience at this point sort of freezing. And says, you know, where is he going with that one? So imagine you think that God, God is, in fact, mortal. But you also uh, happen to believe the following, that cursing one's parents is not a capital offense, that the Bible says that children who curse should be, in fact, killed, and that the Bible is the word of God. Well, you got the same problem of a web of belief that are in tensions with each other. And again, the process of reflective, reflective equilibrium is such that you go back and you examine these, each one of these, you look at the evidence. Some of this stuff is based on evidence. I mean, does the Bible actually say that children who curse should be killed? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, so that one you can cross off. It's like, yeah, that's empirically um, well-grounded. So what about the other ones? Well, then you might have to modify one of those. You may decide that God is, in fact, not mortal. That would be my preferred option. You may decide that the, the, the Bible is not the direct word of God. That's what a lot of mainstream Christians actually decide, that it's you know, metaphorical. It's a sort of stories that is being filtered through the local culture of the time. So no, I don't have to believe everything that I see there literally. Um, or maybe you can decide that, yes, in fact, if my children disobey, they ought to be stoned to death. <laughs> and on that, um, I'm, I'm going to leave you with uh, some of the words that, as I said, that, that inspired the whole, the whole project. Uh, some things in life are bad. They can really make you mad. Other things just make you swear and curse. If we were later in the afternoon and you had drunk a little bit, we will sing at this point. Uh, when you're chewing on life, crystals, don't grumble. Give a whistle and this helps things turn out the best. Always look on the bright side of life. Thank you very much for your attention.